fellowship in Christ. And uh, as far as this theme is concerned, the sub-theme for tonight is our common interest. So fellowship in Christ, our common interest. I won't necessarily be doing a verse-by-verse exposition, but as a guiding passage for tonight, if you may please turn to Galatians 3, 28. I'll just read it and also make reference to it as we continue in the message. So, fellowship in Christ, <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry, specifically for tonight, our common interest. Galatians 3.28 is a guiding passage, but like I've said, I wouldn't necessarily be doing a verse-by-verse verse exposition. The verse thus reads, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, despite the winter cold, we pray that you'll warm our hearts, even as you have already with a wonderful singing. Uh, truly, we find great grace only in you and through you. And we pray even as we look forward to your coming, that you'll continue to strengthen us as the church, local and universal, in as far as our fellowship is concerned, that even truly we will be one, we will be united, that as your word even says, that uh, by the great love that is amongst us, many may know that we are truly disciples of you. And we pray that this will ring true even in tonight's message. We pray this believing and trusting in your good name. Amen. So fellowship in Christ, specifically for tonight, our common interest. Now, the theme of fellowship is important for various reasons. I'll highlight two. One of the reasons it, it is important is because of how God created us. It's because of how God created us. It is not good for man to be alone, God says in Genesis. By implication then, it is not good for a woman as well, or even a child to be alone. It doesn't just apply to man. Adam and Eve only became one once they were connected to each other and specifically by the common interest that they had. They found something in common. And we see that as far as how God designed man, he designed him in such a way that he needs companionship, that he needs fellowship. It is almost impossible to define ourselves outside of each other. Prime example is today. Happy Father's Day. But can you be a father without a child? It is impossible. Son, daughter, mother, brother, sister. It is impossible to define you outside of other people. Even when you're making all kinds of applications, what is the one thing that is always asked for? Next of kin. The idea is that you are never alone and are always defined through other people. Have you ever wondered why, even with the greatest commandment, part of it is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It is impossible to fulfill this commandment on your own, outside of other people. And that's why this theme of fellowship is important, because God created us a certain way, whereby we desire, demand, and truly cannot be defined outside of our common interest, our common fellowship. The second reason why this theme is important is because we've corrupted how God created us. Not only because of how God created us, but because we've corrupted how he created us. We see this clearly in scripture, still in Genesis, that when man broke fellowship with God, he also broke fellowship with fellow man. We see this with Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, brother against brother, such that one would kill the other. Love the Lord with all your being and your neighbor as yourself, but then because there was no love for God, there will be no love for fellow man. So because of sin, we are broken and divided, such that the hostility amongst people is to the point of even killing each other. We wouldn't stop at our divisions, but take it to the extent of even killing each other. So God creates us a certain way, but we've corrupted that because of sin. When Adam looked at Eve, all he could see and focus on was their common interest, what made them alike. 
within the context, you see that it was clear that man was distinct from animals. And so when he saw Eve, it was what? Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. Someone unique that I can identify with and even have common interest and common fellowship. Man created in the image of God. That is what we see in Genesis. But then the problem, because of sin, we now focus on what divides us rather than what unites us. It's no longer our, the image of God in us. It's no longer flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones, but rather what divides us. And in society, we see this clearly as far as the divisions because we are divided amongst interests, or rather common interests, that are not so common to everyone. And that is the problem that we see. We are divided along family lines, and we say what? Blood is thicker than water. We are divided along tribal li lines, along language as well. We are divided along the lines of nationality. We'll know even in our country here, xenophobia is a key issue. We are divided along race, again, a key issue here. Even along profession. What is the one question that always comes up almost immediately you meet a person for the first time? What do you do? What do you do? So that I know how I may relate with you. We are divided along education lines, along wealth as well and class, right? Money talks. So if you don't have money, don't talk to me, right? We are divided along gender, age, marital status. When you're young, the young adults ministry is your favorite, right? But then when you get married, you begin to behave as if you're 60. <laughs> and say, you know what, that is not for me anymore. <laughs> I'm in a different class, right? This is us today. Divided along varied types of lines. We fellowship across different lines, different interests. And those interests have divided us. And truly, even when you look at a basic definition of fellowship is simply this friendly association and especially with those whom you have a common interest in right association with those you have a common interest in. so you align to those whom you think you identify with each other along various lines even as we've seen and highlighted quite a number but then we see that truly as believers, this shouldn't be so. This shouldn't be so. Even as our governing passage reads, we are all one in Christ, right? And so you'd expect something different from believers, but then the problem as well is this. It is not always the case. It is not always the case. And Galatians as well, still in that book, is a primary example of that because here we see that even some of the most prominent and mighty men that we know from the scriptures, instrumental in the foundation of the church, fell into this temptation. In Galatians chapter 2, if you could just turn a page back, from verse 11, we see that this was even a temptation for the church as far as breaking fellowship. In Galatians 2 from verse 11, this is what Paul writes. And he says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men, verse 12, came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews ha acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Peter and Barnabas, two of some of the most well-known church leaders and founders, fell into this great temptation in terms of their association and their fellowship within the church. As long as they were fellowshipping with the Gentiles, they really enjoyed themselves. And we know of Gentiles, they would be liberal, not as rigid as the Jews. So they must have been having quite a good time. But then when the Jews, certain Jews, finally came in, you see their hypocrisy, what Paul call, calls hypocrisy there. Because now they broke the fellowship with the Gentiles and began to behave as if they were Jews again. This is what they were simply saying. Peter, Paul, Peter and Barnabas were saying this, that as far as the Gentile believers are concerned, we have this common fellowship, which is Christ, a common interest. 
And so because of that, we'll associate with them. But then in the presence of the Jews, it's as if they are saying, there's a higher common interest. There's a higher fellowship that transcends even that of Christ, and that is the Jews. And hence the temptation came to them, and they decided to pretend that they were not hanging out with the Gentiles after all. And we see here one of the greatest confrontations in Scripture, right? Peter, or Paul, against Peter, two of the most prominent church leaders and founders. And you truly, you cannot miss the irony, right? Because when you read Acts chapter 10, Peter was actually the first one in the church to preach to the Gentiles after being given a revelation by God. So he more than anyone knew that Gentiles indeed can be saved and there's nothing wrong with them. You can fellowship with them. But because fellow Jews came into town, he fell into the temptation of drawing divisions. There's a common association that I have with my fellow Jews. And as far as the circumcision is concerned, let me pretend that I wasn't fellowshipping with the Gentiles, right? He made another association, another common interest, higher than the common interest that they shared in Christ. And this is why the Apostle Paul confronts him. He, more than anyone, should have known because he was the first to preach to the Gentiles. His experience in the revelation from God would have taught him that. And this is the same with us, right? It's the same with us. Because the fear of man, rather than God, overcomes us from time to time, right? And pride as well, such that we rather maintain a certain association when the temptation is high and overlook the association that we have with Christ. For Peter, it was clearly the circumcision. And truly Jews were proud of the circumcision. And because of this pride, he was led astray. It's as if they are saying, unless you are like us, you will not have fellowship with us. Unless you are like us, you will not have fellowship with us. Instead of, unless you are like Christ. Right? Unless you are like Christ, you will not have fellowship with us. This is the thinking that Paul is confronting. Still in Galatians chapter 2, in verse 14, this is what it says. When I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. I say to Cephas, being Peter, before them all, so he confronted him publicly to his face, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And in chapter 5, still confronting this issue, this is what he says in verse 2. Chapter 5, it says, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. And these are profound statements, right? In chapter 2, verse 14, and in chapter 5, verse 2. Two key things arise from that. Your conduct is not in step with the gospel, and Christ has no advantage to you. Paul was furious because Peter, being a Jew, freely fellowshiped with the Gentiles because of their common interest in Christ. But when fellow Jews came into town, he behaved as if there's a higher common interest, Judaism, the circumcision. And here we see that truly the apostle is confronting that and telling Peter, your conduct is not in step with the gospel. Your conduct is not in step with the gospel. Christ will be of no advantage to you. Because it is only in Christ that we are connected on a unique level that transcends any other connection. And this is still the theme of Galatians, even as we read earlier in Galatians 3.28, and I'll read it again. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, verse 29, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And in the interest of time, we won't get through the whole chapter, but you can read earlier sections of that chapter. That is the case that Paul is making, that you're children of Abraham by faith. And that is what then unites us in terms of our common interest. Not children of Abraham by circumcision, because then that divides us, but children of Abraham by faith, because then that unites us. That is our common interest which transcends all other interests, all other divisions that we may have 
along uh, in our lives from a human perspective. The idea is that in Christ, we are all equal. Do you get that idea? In Christ, we are all equal. I cannot look at one person and say, you are this, I am not this, and another, you are this, I am not this, or I am this, you are not. Because in Christ, we are all equal. A fellowship, a common interest that transcends all other interests. Our identity in Christ as Christians transcends any other identity that we may associate with during the week. All manner of divisions amongst us, even those that I highlighted earlier, they fall away because of Christ, and this is what is being highlighted here. We've mentioned the greatest commandment, which is to love God, obviously, and your fellow neighbors yourself. But then there's also a new commandment which Christ himself gave to us. We find that in John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, in verses 34 and 35, this is what it says. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. And as we consider this theme of fellowship, the question to ask then is this. If someone was looking in from the outside, based on this new commandment that Christ has given us, would they be able to look inside and say yes, despite the interests that divide us along certain lines, do we find a higher common interest in Christ such that this so-called love from, based on the new com commandment is prevalent among such, such, such that an outsider can say, truly, those are disciples of Christ. Why? Because they see the great love amongst us that transcends all other common interests. Can someone really say these are disciples of Christ or do they see us divided along our abilities, our age, status, education, family background, gender, race, tribe, or even language? That is the question that comes to us this evening. Can we confidently say that, yes, as far as the great commandment and even the new commandment, we can be pointed out as great examples because we are disciples of Christ. How? Because we do have love one for another or is what paul is saying true that our conduct is not in step with the gospel but that rather christ is of no advantage to us you see like adam who saw one like himself when he saw eve in whom he shared a common interest so are we to look at each other in the same way having this common interest that transcends any other interest as children of Abraham by faith. And the question then as well alongside that, how then do we view non-believers? What do we do with them? If we have this common interest that transcends all other forms of fellowship, how do we then fellowship with non-believers? Paul answers that for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. From verse 19, this is what the apostle says. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. Verse 21, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I'll become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And then verse 23, which sums it up nicely, I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. 
Paul here is simply saying this. When you look at Peter, Peter ate with the Gentiles only because he, they had that common interest that they are both believers, right? But Paul here, it's as if he's taking it another level and he's saying, I will not wait to eat with the Gentiles, with the non-believers, once they are saved. I will eat with them even before they are saved because my fellowship with them probably may lead to them getting saved. And he says, obviously, that he does this without compromising his faith, without sinning, because he says that he operates as one not being outside of the law, but under the law of Christ. Paul here is simply saying that he transcends man-made divisions. When he's interacting with the Jew, when he's interacting with the Greek, he transcends man-made divisions, obviously, without sinning, so that he may reach them. It's the same concept. As those in Christ, we have a higher common interest, which is Christ. And so that causes us to transcend all other common interests, which are not so common, which divide us, so that we unite in Christ. And here Paul is saying that as far as those man-made divisions, even when he's reaching out outside there, without sinning, of course, then he sets them aside as well. He breaks down those barriers. The idea here we are get, that you're getting here is that we as well, in our reaching out as far as the gospel is concerned, we are to transcend those barriers. The idea that comes to us here is that this, despite our divisions along human lines, the wealthy reach out to the poor and the poor to the wealthy. The old reach out to the young and the young to the old. The educated to the lay, the lay to the educated. We transcend all kinds of barriers, all kinds of boundaries, so that we may reach others for Christ, because that Paul says, doing it for the sake of the gospel, because you may just win some. You see, as mankind, we have this common interest. Whether saved or not, that we are all created in the image of God. And so you find that, yes, there is this fellowship we have in Christ as Christians and we fellowship uniquely as such, but then it doesn't mean that you stay in that circle. You look at others who are also created in the image of God and you see that there's a common interest there, which is also divine. And because of that, then you are motivated to go out there and say, come, as one who has a common interest in me, as one created in the image of God, let me show you what it means to have true fellowship with this God in Christ as children of Abraham by faith. And because of that, then we break down barriers that divide us that we may reach out. And in breaking down those barriers, it begins with us. It begins with us here exemplifying that we are truly disciples of Christ by the love that is shown amongst us. Then we can duplicate that outside there. As I close, I want us to consider Christ. And if you're keen, in the morning, this is exactly what Joseph was preaching at some point. Because you see, Jesus Christ, and I like what Pastor Joseph mentioned as far as the humanity aspect of him and even going to Philippians chapter 2. Because you see, Jesus Christ exemplifies best what we are talking about here. Common fellowship that transcends boundaries. Because if you consider what Jesus Christ or who Jesus Christ is, you find that one, he is God, and we are not, right? He is eternal, we are not. He is perfect, we are not, right? He is holy, we are not. Pastor Joseph referred to his glory, and certainly he is glorified, and we are absolutely not. It's as if you look at Christ and you say, he is everything we are not, right? And so there is this barrier that divides us with Christ, which truly no man can bridge. But then if you remember what Pastor Joseph was saying in the morning, what happened? This great God overcome all these barriers, him being God and glorified as well, 
and took on the form of a man, right? Philippians 2, being conformed to humanity. Not only that he may be found amongst us, but leading to the cross as well. A work that eventually unites us with him. You see, in Philippians 2, he conforms himself to our image, to ourselves, to, our, to mankind, so that in Romans 8.29, we may be conformed to him. The gospel is about the God who conformed himself, breaking down the barriers that he had, insurmountable barriers as well, that he had with mankind, bridging that so that mankind may be conformed to him in the end. No one exemplifies what it means to break barriers that we may be united and find common fellowship more than Christ. Being everything that we are not, having insurmountable barriers between us and him, between us and God, he overcame those barriers when he took on the form of a man, saying, I'll be conformed to you to the point of even death so that you may be conformed to me. Romans 8 says, conformed to the image of his son so that what? He may be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Firstborn amongst many brethren. What is that? Fellowship. Christ said, I will transcend this boundary between you and God, between you and me. We have no common interest at all. You are condemned. I am glorified. But I will transcend that interest just so I may reach you. And he did it all without sinning. He did it all without sinning. And it is because of that then we have an eternal bond, an eternal fellowship with him as brethren with him being the firstborn amongst us. No one exemplifies this more than Christ. And that's why he himself says that this is how they will know you are my disciples. When you transcend all your other boundaries and find each other in the common interest, in the common fellowship that you have in me, and in the same way transcend the boundaries that are out there in society because they are those who are created in the image of God so that you may reach them as well. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, reminding us of who you are and what you've done for us. And even how you reached out to us despite not having anything in common with us, that we may know you and have fellowship with you. And you exemplified this when you took on the form of a man. And we saw that even when you walked the earth, your ministry transcended all kinds of boundaries. You ministered to the poor, to the rich, to the religious, to the apathetic, to the leaders, to the lay, to the old, to the young, to the Jews, and even to the Gentiles. And in that, O oh Lord, we do find salvation. We find this common interest in you that we are brethren of whom you are the firstborn. And we pray that even as we walk this earth, as we journey as disciples of you, this will be true of us from those who are looking in from the outside and that it will also be true of us as those who go outside to extend this higher interest in you that many may also become children of Abraham by faith. We pray this believing and trusting in your good name. Amen.